generate four times as much carbon and generate six times as much power as a rooftop solar system. There are national feeding tariffs in Germany and UK and France and Netherlands for residential scale fuel cells. This is an issue which can't be palmed off to the states, which is typically the response we get. The federal government is really serious about energy reform. So will the government be looking at creating a national feeding tariff for residential fuel cells and other low emission technologies? Thanks for that question. Uh, we are serious about a clean energy uh, future, which is why, of course, we've uh, pressed on uh, with putting a price on carbon, and I continue to uh, move around explaining what that means for Australians. And as David said, it's been a controversial debate, and it's going to continue to be a controversial debate as we legislate the scheme we announced um, through the Parliament during the uh, remaining months of this year and it comes into effect on the 1st of July next year. Uh, we've said, you know, that's the sort of important project with the complementary measures that we've announced. Uh, I have received an energy efficiency report which invites government to canvas some broader questions and obviously uh, we'll have the internal discussions on that. Uh, but, you know, our focus will remain on delivering the carbon price package that we've announced. Uh, I believe uh, that you know, the importance of that is that, that it sends uh, the right market signals in the most efficient way. And I think uh, there is concern that there are schemes uh, in existence that states have gone for that aren't compatible between states, they're not national, and have implied in them a far greater price per tonne for abatement uh, than the carbon pricing scheme that will be in, in place nationally. Uh, so I can't uh, give you the answer you probably want to hear, uh, but uh, you know we, we're serious about a clean energy future and we believe carbon pricing uh, is the best route to get there. Well, I'll use the privilege of the Chair to ask the last question. <laughs> um, Prime Minister, what are the ideas that you're passionate about that aren't currently part of the, the national public debate or aren't sufficiently prominent in that debate? Mm -hmm. Look, I think uh, that... You know, the uh, great delight of this uh, position is that I, I do get the opportunity to uh, inject a lot into our national conversations and shape the things that we're talking about. I believe that there's uh, a lot that uh, the government has done and that we are moving uh, to with the release of the Productivity Commission reports. There's a lot there. Uh, when you, you look across it all... Um, you know, whether it's clean energy future, the productivity challenges, the participation challenges, uh, they're about strengthening and modernising our economy. Uh, when you uh, look at the suite of government issues, they're about extending opportunity and we've talked about our university reforms, for example, there and there are many others. Uh, so I think there are uh, many important uh, detailed topics on the agenda it's really about uh, ensuring that the national debate uh, works its way through them, uh, not only on their own merits, but in a way that builds the connections. Uh, I, I certainly don't view my role as injecting an issue out there for debate as a bit of disconnected stuff mm -hmm. uh, from, from a broader project. Uh, the broader project, to me, is clear. It is about... Uh, uh, strengthening and modernising our economy so that we can offer uh, shared opportunity for Australians and opportunity in a new way uh, with more personal empowerment and choices than we've had before. We've got a set of individual policy questions that add up to that and so for people who are passionate about engaging uh, in the public policy debate I would direct them to that menu that's there now uh, because there's a lot of depth there and a lot of big questions to work through. Well Julia Gillard Thank you for your insights and reflections this morning. Um, to conclude, uh, I'd like to invite John Denton, Chief Executive of Course Chambers Westgarth, to come up and offer a vote of thanks. Thanks very much, uh, David, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Prime Minister. Cause is a, a world-class law firm determined to drive Australia's competitiveness and its economic engagement with Asia. And in that context, of course, it makes perfect sense for us to host the Prime Minister today as she lays out, again, a reform agenda for this country. And also it's a great pleasure to work with an organisation such as Per Capita as we work with major universities and other think tanks as we seek to drive the debate to ensure that the issues that are most important to Australians around competitiveness are at the forefront. 
One thing that um, I'd like to, to focus on a little today is that having lifted the, uh, the discussion from the day to day and actually trying to push the discussion out beyond uh, the, uh, over the horizon, it's actually beyond our borders as well. <clears throat> I have the privilege of dealing most recently with the Prime Minister in the context of discussions at the G20 and also at APEC. Um, the reason I raise that is that one thing I don't think the Prime Minister is fully commended for is her direct engagement and understanding and grappling with the most important issue to do is with, to do with uh, global economic engagement and also global security issues. I think it's, uh, it hasn't been focused on enough that as soon as the Prime Minister emerged as the leader of this country, she engaged immediately in trying to understand and grapple with the context in which the G20 is operating. Not enough time and effort is spent in this country in understanding how important it is to actually set the architecture for the future. As the, uh, the, the architecture was set around Bretton Woods, that the outcome of that served, this, served the nation and served the global community very, very well for 40 or 50 years. Such is the intensity that needs to be brought to the discussions at the G20. And can I say that the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister have both done so and will continue to do so. The Prime Minister has also recognised the importance of ensuring that the region in which we operate in, which is the fastest growing region, the APEC region, is properly ambitious in its goals. And she has participated, particularly at last year's leaders' meeting uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the APEC process in Yokohama, in ensuring that the ambition of APEC was raised to the whole concept of regional economic integration. I don't think people realise yet how important that ambition will be for setting the architecture for this region as well. The other area on, on global security, the Prime Minister has pushed, and we will now see towards the end of this year, a reconstituted uh, East Asia summit will bring in for the first time America and a couple of other critical players. But the reason that is so important, because we're going to talk about economic growth, you need to ensure that there's security stability as well. And the Prime Minister is rightly engaged in that, and actually we're rightly delivering that as an outcome for, for the global community, but also for Australia. The Prime Minister mentioned China. And earlier this year, the, China, uh, the Prime Minister made a timely and, I think, important visit to China. But one of the big issues that emerges from our understanding and engagement with China is that I don't think we as a nation have yet grappled with the opportunities and implications of the dramatic rise in economic power and authority of China. I'd actually ask the Prime Minister to consider actually conducting and overseeing the creation of a white paper which will actually deal with that. And I think that white paper, if, if I may, should be led by Prime Minister and Cabinet because it's not a foreign policy issue. This may well lead to some important uh, thinking around structural implications for the Australian economy so that we can grapple with and actually take advantage of the opportunities as they emerge. So I commend that as a thought to the Prime Minister. I can also note that towards the end of this year the Prime Minister will assume the chair of uh, the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting will be the most important diplomatic meeting to take place in the Southern Hemisphere this year. The Prime Minister will emerge as the leader of that. And can I can also ask her to think very seriously about how we can reform the Commonwealth to ensure that it continues to make sense. The Commonwealth makes sense in two areas. Business to business relations, because it links up Australia, for example, with India and with, the Afri with Africa, both very important areas for us, and on people to people, which it does through the Commonwealth Games. Those are the two areas that are most important. If we can work to restructure the Commonwealth to actually ensure that those two areas are front and centre, and if the Prime Minister could lead that, we will end up with a very successful Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your time today. I commend you for the, uh, the fortitude that you have. And I also always look, try to look at the shoe leather, but there's still some there. So good, good, luck, good luck and thank you very much again. And to per capita, thank you. Thank you.